All right, so Bessie Lafayette, um, Senior Director of Data Sciences. Um, my focus within the data science team is really about supporting key decisions within the company. So, um, you know, this, uh, data science is applied everywhere, but in, in my case, I really focus on, you know, how do we move the needle at, at the EC level, executive committee level, and whether it's BD, uh, research strategy, helping with some uh, collaboration and partnership around finding the next target to study and stuff like that. Um, I work at, uh, I work at Alexion, I was gonna go 15 years back and tell you about AstraZeneca. No. I work at Alexion, uh, Alexion Pharmaceuticals, a rare disease company. So we have transformative treatment for uh, autoimmune condition, uh, metabolic condition, and also a, a, uh, um, an enzyme replacement. Uh, if you want to know uh, about all the, the great work we do for rare disease patients, you can go to alexion.com. So today I'll focus about, you know, how do we build this rare disease data master? And I'll go from the challenges all the way to the approach and, and show you some workflow. Um, and the key, the key point here is this clinically significant. So when you're in a research setting, essentially, um, you know, any data goes. That that's all good, you want to bring it all together. Because this is about finding insights, discovering things, trying new things. When you move to the clinical settings, you're talking about a physician seeing a patient and having to make a decision on the next step. Very different. You gotta, be make, you gotta make sure that the data that you're providing to this physician is accurate and trusted by the physician. So rare diseases, what's the challenge? Well, there's a lot. We don't have a rare disease master. So by this I mean, you know, how many rare diseases exist? If I ask you, you would know. If you would go to you know, some of the key sources at the bottom, Orphanet, uh, Gene Reviews, ClinGen, Nord, which is for, for the US. Uh, Orphanet is a European uh, consortia. And then we go to OMIM, you'll get different numbers. Um, the belief out there is about seven to 9,000. Um, and, and they don't, you know, research, uh, the academia, clinics, and healthcare don't all agree about what is a rare disease and, and how do you count them. Um, we use Orphanet as, a, as the centerpiece and uh, this covers about 7,000 uh, rare diseases. And when you look at the healthcare system, especially in the US, uh, ICD codes is how uh, hospitals and physician and clinic bill for medical care. And on, there's only 128 ICD code attached to 7,000 plus rare conditions. So you only have a tiny, tiny coverage. So it shows you the gap. And from a drug perspective, a treatment perspective, there's about 161 condition, uh, rare disease condition out of the 7,000, 9,000 or more um, that have an approved drug. So very, very small number. So that's, that's the challenge. But, but the key point and why I focused on that, I wish it existed and I could carry on, but I, we ended up having to build it, is that this is the backbone, right? If you don't know what you're talking about, how can you attach to it this thing called a rare condition? How do you attach to it anything else? Treatment plan, drugs. If you're saying, I'm gonna design a clinical trial, how are you gonna select the patient? Is it this condition or that condition? Some of them are very, very similar. And, and, and as I said, academic clinics and healthcare don't always agree, are these two conditions different? So this is our analysis approach. This is how we operate. As a, you know, we, we run analysis, and, and this approach has been applied to building the Rare Disease Master. We always start with, why are we doing this? What is the question? Then we go to the analysis. How do we solve this? What will it take to answer this question? Then we identify the data for it, and then obviously we deliver an outcome. But then we don't stop there, because we go to the subject matter, the partner, the stakeholder, and say, are you gonna do anything with this analysis? Because if you don't, that whole thing was waste of time. So it's very key that you have that extra feedback loop. And then if there's an issue, or if it's not meeting the, the, you know, the end point or whatever you're trying to answer, then you go back to fix your analysis, maybe get new data, maybe get updated data, and do this cycle. So some examples, you wanna go from the left-hand side 
and then which is the question where you're trying to achieve and on the right hand side the type of data you have to go after. We're in rare disease, we don't have big data, so we have a lot of missing data and that's why a lot of my time is spent over here. It's licensing and paying for data. Now this is a NIME event, so we use NIME at the center of this cycle, right? This feedback loop. Um, and why we did that? Because we do need agility. We need, we need, you know, as we interact with stakeholders, partners, even our, amongst ourselves, you want to be able to quickly change your workflow, your analysis, and, and, and you know, modify the business rules, right? And it's all about knowledge sharing. So we'll see a bit later, but we build rare disease uh, and, and, and the whole knowledge base initially, and it was, you know, 10 engineers plus, massive graph, you know, indexation through Elasticsearch, Swagger to expose it, bunch of Python, loads of Java. We lost track. We were asking, okay, our finet change of format, or we got a new field, and first thing you know, oh, it's gonna take three weeks because you have to update the Java, you have to load in the graph, you've gotta change your index, and then potentially change your API before the Python users could use it. So we got rid of all that replaced everything with NIME. So we have a series of pipeline, which I'll show in a second, and um, it's me and one contractor. So we, we got rid of all that. All we have is a NIME server and, and NIME desktop. The other thing is NIME is, is open source, so on the desktop side. So I work with research institutes. They don't wanna buy any commercial product. First of all, it may not be the same that I have, and, and, if, and they don't have the budget for that. So what I do is I say, install this desktop for free, and either I email or point them to my NIME server, and I say, just look at this pipeline and pick it up. And then they do it, they download, they open it up, and then they run it, and it magically works, right? So that has been um, a key factor for, for, for selecting this. Um, the last thing is that the knowledge is the most important thing for us. It's the how you got there. It's not so much, you know, here's, a, here's an executable, run it against your data. We can't do that for multiple reasons. As we work with healthcare, they're research projects, but we still work with healthcare partners. And I'm a pharma. I can't just say, run this, right? I have to tell them, this is how you fish. This is the recipe. They go and take it, and then they apply it to their data. And then we have this collaboration. So rare disease now, uh, uh, you know, the master. First, what you do is, and these are all logos of, of various sources um, that exist out there. There's a ton more. We basically ingested everything. We pulled everything in. We bought everything. Uh, we paid for curation. We did all of that. Then we ended up with this massive knowledge. Then we went to the, the clinician and we said, you know, have a look at this. And the clinician came back and says, that's not a causal gene. Um, I don't trust this. Wh where did you get that from? So that feedback look, took a while, and then we narrowed it down to the subset. The subset of what clinician in your clinic, your hospital settings, that's what they would trust when it comes to rare disease. And you know, basically, if you were going to build one of those things, you know, looking at the various dimensions, you would be, you'd be picking, that's the recipe at a high level, essentially. You'd be picking parts of this. Um, and Ken, you must be familiar with all this, right? Um, yeah, maybe what I want to mention is all, all these, um, you know, gold, orange line, these are nine pipelines, right? Okay, I've I been working in enterprise architecture or information enterprise architecture for a while in a privacy life and um, when I started to use NIME and I started to do these workflows and build these workflows I was it was fun we went fast but then after a while I'm like oh my god we're gonna step on each other's toes we're gonna have you know complete chaos if we're not careful if we're on a scale this and so a pipeline is not <clears throat> Python or Java code so you can't really rely on the wisdom, knowledge, guidelines, best practices of code and continuous integration. 
it's not quite a document, so you can't rely solely on life cycle document management. It's kind of in between. So I don't know about you guys, <clears throat> and I don't know how our NIME responds to this, but this whole life cycle management of workflows is going to have to be an hybrid between document life cycle management and code life cycle management in order to, to scale out this thing and, and be able to collaborate. Um, these, this is just one example of how we solved it for us to get rid of the chaos is we create this tiered approach whereby we said, you know, of course there's a set of downloads, that's the first step, but then after that is, okay, whatever we have, <clears throat> we need to normalize it. And so we create these masters, normalize it. And once it's normalized, that's fine. These are, these are ready for consumption. Then we have a new set of data with the pipelines that, that come with it to generate this. It's basically creating these derived data set, which I call useful. It, it could combine a couple of master together, like gene and condition, and a few other attributes that you know are useful for further analysis. That's your level two. And then we went on to level three, and based on these derived data sets, we will run analysis and analysis. It's great. We've done a few of those, works fine. And then if you're so lucky, and in some instances, you get to the insight, whereby you combine some of these analysis, you need the killer visualization, and, and you know, if you get to level four in the decision support in, a, in an enterprise, you're going against subject matter experts. So you're going against big egos. In front of you, you've got this, these pers this, this individual 20 years of experience, PhD in X, Y, and Z, uh, with this gut feeling. And you're coming at him with this insight. So, you know, you don't win those battles often uh, if you contradict this individual. Um, so you've got you to make sure you've got your full lineage here. You know how you got to the data, from the data all the way to your analysis. And all the way through, you, you've, been, you've you share and you expose the business rules and the logic that you follow. If you do that, at least you stand a chance to, to get a comment like, that was a good effort, that's a really nice piece of work. I disagree, and right, or you know what? We'll take it into consideration. So you, know, you, you don't win them all, but if you don't have that, if you come at it with a black box, uh, you know, you're never gonna win this battle. So that's why NIME, again, is very useful. So rare disease master is really focused on level zero and one. We don't do, right, this is a master. This is, this is the normalized view of rare diseases. And uh, as you can see, and that's, that's uh, some of the list. So these are all the downloads. And all f download is not just, you know, get files, save as. It's sometimes some transformation are required. And from all of that, then you normalize and you create these master. The disease master, the drug master, the gene master, the trial master, the cupid leader master, and all these other masters. And then all of these are the pipelines that, that allow you to create it. So I'm just going to open up this. Uh, I have a magic wand, I guess. I'm going to open up this disease alias index. So this is the core of it. Obviously, I don't use component and wrap meta nodes. Um, but this is just to show you that once you've done all the work in the background, you still have to do uh, some work to kind of bring together the disease master. And what I've done for presentation purposes, um, I've just collapsed all of this. So for us, the component aspect or the new feature having components is going to be super useful because this is the same pipeline, right? I've wrapped it. Some of these are going to become components that are going to be shareable right across the board. So what do we do here, just very briefly? So we go from, you know, we start with Orphanet because we trust that. That's what we heard. ClinGen, we trust that. We're going to map it out. And then if, if none of, you know, that's all good. So you've got your master and all your aliases with exact match from curators and so on. Then you end up going to OMIM, and OMIM is a, it's not necessarily highlighting uh, conditions that a, a patient will have, but definitely if you have this um, you know, modification in your, in your gene, you may end up having this, this phenotype, and that may or may not lead to a condition. So OMEM is still 
very useful for clinician, but it's not what we would call a tier one impactful uh, a piece of information. Orphanet is and ClinGen are the key ones, but they still said, you know, worst case, I want OMIM, so let's let's get that in there. And the way we build it is, it's all Orphanet, all its aliases, causal genes, and all that good stuff, and and what conditions map to each other, and then we say. In the OMIM space, what's not matched then is added to the list. And then we go to drug bank because that's our path, our bridge to the drug available and approved uh, drugs. And then we, we add the expert reviews at the end. What ends up happening is all of this is created locally and then it's pushed to S3. And that's where I get uh, the, the master data set. So what have we done so far? So what we've done is obviously we went to all inclusive. I described that we got feedback, we came back, limited it, and 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 you know we got the recipe that you saw. Um, what we plan to do next is basically um, improve that that rare disease uh, master. I mean, I think ultimately, and we're working on that. So maybe some announcements will come, but we want to work in partnership with others. We don't want to. We, we don't want to own the rare disease master. We want the rare disease master to be something that, that is owned by some entity out there. So there's a lot of conversation that have been ongoing and will be ongoing uh, in 2020. Uh, but we feel that like we get about 80% right, um, given the feedback from clinician. So what we want to do is get improve the feedback loop, and, and I think the nine portal is going to be a key element there. And then um, we, we stayed away. Uh, on purpose uh, with anything, uh, anything uh, uh, that is not business rule has been left out. So business rule as in, you know, so if it's got a causal gene coming from this source and, and um, it's, got, it's coming from Orphanet or ClinGen, we trust, that's it. And if that, if Orphanet says this is the OMIM identifier, or this is the other data source identifier, we, we want that. So we, it's hard-coded business, business rule. We want to introduce NLP um, and, and some other capabilities, maybe even uh, machine learning, but basically to, to kind of assess, you know, with clustering you can see like, okay, there's a group over here, a group over here, maybe we want to spend most of our time with curators, uh, you know, to decipher or to, to understand a bit more on, on these set of conditions. Maybe they're the same condition, Maybe there is no condition there, and it's just an artifact of one, one of those sources. So this is our, our plan uh, going forward. Um, we have a collaboration environment. Obviously, all of this uh, is happening in the cloud. Uh, so Alexander Cloud, um, we have a VPC on Amazon. We have a NIME server running on it. And so again, looking at using NIME server and doing release management, right? Everybody's got a sandbox. We move stuff to QC. One this pass, it goes to the master, Alexion Common, which has a bunch of workflows beyond the data master. And then the partners have their own space as well, where we contribute to. And the Nine Portal has been and will be more used for these, these partner viewers, like the physician. They're not going to come here and, and play with Nine. Um, that's, that's the informatics folks at the Research Institute. But the, the partners, like clinicians uh, may, you know, we'll go, we'll go through, uh, through the, NIME, uh, the NIME portal. All right, so what's the role of a rare disease master? I kind of talked about it, but essentially, if you're a patient and you've got a, a mutation or your MD or whoever your clinic says you have this condition and it's a rare disease condition, then what? No MD knows seven to 9,000 rare disease conditions. They just don't. So the work that I share with you is this thing in the middle here. It's essential for everything. And so we've built everything. All you see here is built. I focus on this, this uh, RDM piece over here. Um, but it, just to show you that's critical. Because once you have that, um, then you can go on the other side and say, what is the diagnostic? What's the description? There may be some option. You may have a condition, but actually, because you have this variant, maybe you have this other condition that also is where the gene is causal. And believe it or not, it does exist. There's quite a few. And then we provide the treatment, whether it's an ongoing trial, a condition, intervention. And then by matching the left and the right side, 
you, you then get diagnostic information and available treatment options, right? So this is happening today, um, but I just, what I talked about mostly was this RDM and show you its central piece. So while we're doing this, that, that concludes my talk. I mean, essentially, um, our goal is to reduce the diagnostic journey in rare diseases. Uh, we're talking about seven years plus for, for most rare diseases. It, given what's out there and some of the pilots that we've done in collaboration we've made, um, it can be weeks. We have cases. Uh, we work with a, a children's hospital in San Diego. Uh, the, the rare disease center is called RADI. And uh, uh, Dr. Kingsmore, who we work with, uh, has applied some of that playbook and um, you know, had a 24-hour challenge. And in 2018, February 2018, uh, diagnosed a kid within nine, what, 19 hours from a Neil Prick sequence. Uh, so we got the gene part, uh, NLP against the uh, medical records, and matching against a rare disease master and equivalent of, uh, and providing uh, the treatment, which was a vitamin deficiency, so it wasn't even a costly drug. That kids was saved 19 hours, so seven years versus 19 hours. So that's the power of, of, of all of this. Um, and hopefully, as we get with partnership with, with the healthcare, and, and, and some of the patient advocacy group, we can start building this flywheel whereby the real world stuff, what clinicians actually see and what's happening when they diagnose patient, they can feed it back to the center and then this rare disease master will get improved over time. It's not happening today, uh, but that's something uh, we thrive for. That's it. Thank you. Very cool. I think there was also a very nice example of how important the feedback is, right? And how can I help to incorporate that feedback, which aligns well with what Michael was talking about yesterday in the morning. Questions? Yes, Ken. That's, uh, that's impressive. That is really hard work. I know that. Um, how much of what you're doing is API based versus web scraping and how do you keep pace with changing standards with some of these databases and web services? We have two minutes, all right? Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, we've, we've done it all, that meaning scraping, meaning downloading database, dump, and then rebuilding it internally. We did all of this. And what turned out, what we're doing right now is, is look, we're like, if I can license the data, I pay for it, and I get it in a nice format. And yes, they do change. That's why we have the level zero. The level zero pipelines, their job is focused on download. So if, if there is um, a change in format, but it's still the, inf the same information content, then you deal with that at the level zero. So you still get the same signature file with the same information content on the other side, and then the rest of your pipelines are not broken. Um, it's when the information content changes that then has downstream effect, right? Because then you download that extra piece, and then you go, okay, now I'm going to update my masters, and then and that has downstream, downstream effect. Uh, we try not to do uh, web scraping anymore and all of that stuff, right? We want to be compliant and, and, and copyright compliant. So um, we pay curators. They do the web scraping. <laughs> and they, but it, whatever they do, we don't know. We just pay them, they gave us a nice list, and I can operate on that. So I guess my point is, I mean, I was, I'm a tech guy, I used to be a tech guy, and now I'm, now I'm a sort of business guy, right? So right now, it's a means to an end. NIME and all this stuff is a means to an end. If I spend 100 grand on a curation, right, versus 200 grand on engineers to build me something that I don't know if it's gonna be useful, I will pay the curators 100 grand and I will get my data and I'll have my answer, which has far more value and impact downstream to answer the question. So I used to be on the side of, oh, let's build everything, let's try everything, and now I'm on the side of, okay, how do I get there fast? Right, and that's why I like the pipelines. Because you don't necessarily have to go deep. You mean, I don't have to do level one, two, three, I can just pay a curator and get my level four answer? Yeah, I'll pay my level four answer, finish my analysis. Nobody at the lower level can, can use it 
but you know, if they have a, have a need for it, then we can pay curators to go upstream and, and provide that data. Hopefully that answers. The <laughs> exactly in two minutes. <laughs> we have another question. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you handle lineage across levels two, three, four, um, particularly when data at level zero changes underneath as well over time? I'm not sure I got yeah. that. So it's, uh, it's about lineage? Lineage across how do you keep track? two, three, four, and yeah. when data changes at level zero, information oh. content changes. Okay. Um, if there is a great solution out there, let me know. But I'll tell you what, what I've decided to do and has been uh, proven at the level four. I keep talking about my tier approach, but sorry. I mean, you've seen the slide, right? So when I'm in front of a big ego with, with some opinions and I have to deal with that, right? Um, what I've been able, the cards I've been able to play back is the full lineage. Like I've done this and this is where the data come from. So how do you do that? So starting from level zero all the way to the top, there are two columns in every data set. There are two additional columns. One is the actual file on the source, the actual file. And then the second one is the provider. So I'll have something like uh, English product one, XML, and I'll have Orphanet, right? Or OMEM and any other file. Or, I'll, or I will have uh, disease, uh, Orphanet mapping, and then it will be data master. So I will always, with these two columns and the information in there, I'm always able to go back to the previous level and downstream. That's how I've done it. And then obviously a hell of a lot of annot annotation in our pipeline. I don't know if you've seen one of my pipeline, but we use the annotation box. We use them as free text. Like there's no node in it. It's just text, like an actual document. So we do not too much of it, but we, our pipelines are, have documentation. You know, what you guys extract through your app, we, it's in our workflow. Why? Because I, I, maybe there's a better way, but that's how we found out is we, we take this file, we send it, and they read this, they adapt the sources to their, to their source, and then they run the pipeline. It's been super useful. I mean, I don't need to provide anything else than the KNWF file, right? And they have everything they need in that. Hi, what are your plans for it? It seems like it could be monetized uh, into a clinical decision support um, and in integrated into an electronic health records. It, it, it could actually reduce a lot of unnecessary medical procedures um, yeah. which the payers would benefit from and the patient. Um, obviously, uh, yes. Uh, and there's so many other use, use for this. We've been uh, collaborating with uh, San Diego children and, and Boston children, uh, but I think, um, and I can't speak of it right now, I'm, but there are talks ongoing right now to, to go nationwide with, with the right partners and, and not to monetize it on our end. Uh, we want to give everything out, so all this stuff, and I was talking to Ken, I hope to put it on the hub. Uh, I just need to do my internal due diligence about what I can share or not. Uh, but um, yeah, the intent is to put it out there for free, but we want to put it inside a vehicle, right? That, that, that will have wings, that will actually make it happen. Because at the end of the day, all we care about is reducing the diagnostic journey for all rare disease, not just ours. We don't, right? And this is a, we've been blessed in a way as a team and under Alexion, uh, you know, to be able to do that for all rare disease. All this work is for all rare disease. It's not Alexion. Uh, specific at all. And that's why we've, that has opened so many doors for us over the last three years. And so uh, stay tuned. Uh, you know, I've been attending meetings at various places lately and then, and then, and then uh, the company is looking into, uh, you know, doing something in that space. Nice. Thank you again. Okay. Really, really nice Thank talk. you. Thank you. I get this. <laughs>